it was late one Friday afternoon, and my wife and I were in the doctor's office. We were getting ready to go on a trip to Acapulco uh, for our last sentient moments as adults before the birth of our first child. Uh, we knew very little about Acapulco other than what we learned on the love boat. Um, <laughs> but we didn't care. <laughs> my wife was five and a half months pregnant, and this was our last chance to get away. So it turned out, the doctor told us, that we would not, in fact, be going to Acapulco. My wife would be going to bed, and we would not be getting out of bed until we had a baby. Just two weeks later, my son Isaiah was born. Isaiah was born at 26 weeks, which is about three months premature. When he was born, he weighed one pound, six ounces, which is just a little bit less than six sticks of butter. One pound, six, six ounces of baby gets you all the parts, but it doesn't get you much of them. My wedding ring could fit up and down over Isaiah's arm. The neonatal intensive care unit uh, is a jarring place at first, full of sounds and wires and noises. There are alarms that go off constantly. And at first when you get there, you hear alarm and you jump, you figure something must be terribly wrong. But you learn over time that the alarms don't always mean an emergency. A nurse will kind of casually walk over and almost without looking will just silence the alarm. So Isaiah spent 91 days in an isolate like that. The highlight of the NICU is what's called kangaroo care. It's when you take uh, your baby and it's your baby's bare skin against your bare chest. So one day I'm holding Isaiah in kangaroo care and he decides to extubate himself, which means that he takes his tube, which allows him to breathe, and pulls it out of his mouth. As you might imagine, alarm goes off, but I am now a veteran NICU traveler, so I pay no attention to the alarm. Within about three seconds, there are seven doctors and nurses descend on me. They rip Isaiah off of me, and they go to work on him. Luckily, within about 30 seconds, they have a tube back in, and he's breathing again. All's well. That's not quite true. I am a complete wreck. <laughs> I am convinced that I have almost stopped my precious son from breathing. The attending physician sees me and takes a moment to come over and tell me that I didn't do anything wrong. This kind of thing happens all the time before he runs off to his next task. So that time in the NICU, uh, watching the team of doctors and nurses who worked to care for my son and many other children in the NICU, has made me think a lot about my day job. I spent the first 10 years of my career as a high school math teacher. And teaching is by far the most rewarding work that I have done. The joy and gratitude that you get uh, spending your day trying to help young people navigate their way through the field of mathematics and through life, although not necessarily in that order, uh, is beyond compare. Teaching is also a job that I failed at every day. Constantly I had to make choices about who I attended to and what I attended to, and at the end of every day I knew I had fallen short. Over time, I had the ability, I had the opportunity to help start a school, to hire teachers, to coach teachers. And what became cemented for me in this work is that if we take seriously this idea that teachers, their job is to educate all kids, then this is a job that is too hard to do by oneself. And yet that's precisely how our system is structured. So for those of us who care about issues of equity and social justice and access, this is an exciting, if challenging, time in education. We're trying to do something unprecedented, which is to educate all kids to high levels. And while we are further toward that target than we've ever been as a country, we still have a long way to go. Last year in Boston, just one in three students read proficiently at the end of third grade. Just one in three eighth graders were enrolled in an algebra class. Just two in three kids graduated high school, and just one in two got some kind of post-secondary degree. And this is at a time of widening earnings gaps, when a college graduate, on average, makes $17,000 more than a high school graduate. Over the years, uh, I've had the opportunity to help prepare 500 teachers. I've worked with hundreds more as colleagues. I have many more as family and friends. And out of this sample, maybe a thousand teachers, the vast, vast majority are people I think incredibly highly of. Smart, 
committed, talented, they care about kids, they work incredibly hard. And so the question is, how could there be so many wonderful people who are teachers, and yet we do not have a system that supports wonderful teaching consistently, every day, every classroom? I came to understand this problem to lie at the intersection of, of two components. One was the complexity and challenge of the job, and the other was the way we prepared and developed teachers. Since I didn't know how to make the job any less complex, I spent a good part of my career focusing on how we prepare teachers. So I started a, a teacher preparation program called the Boston Teacher Residency, which is based on the medical model and on sort of on the apprenticeship system. And in it, novice teachers learn to teach by doing the work. They spend a full year in a school in the kind of community in which they will eventually teach, learning at the elbow of skilled veteran mentor teachers, gradually taking on more and more responsibility over the course of the year. And to date, this kind of program has been quite successful. We're about a decade into the work, and 80% of our graduates are still in teaching in Boston. And this compares to a national average of about 50% of teachers who leave after three years. And yet, it's not enough. When I was in the NICU, a team of doctors descended on my, my child. And um, when you think about thousands of thousands of kids not learning to read. The question is, what alarm sounds for that group of kids? What team descends on them? Who helps them get back on course? The issue I've come to understand has to do in the way we organize teaching and that we need a radical change in the way we do that. So I've thought about this team of doctors and nurses and what they may have to teach us about, about teaching. So a couple ideas about that. First, the team of doctors and nurses who worked with my son and all the other children in the NICU had shared responsibility for a collective goal, the health and well-being of every child in the NICU. Imagine, if you will, a team of teachers who together have shared responsibility for a group of students. These are our kids. That team might meet every morning and talk about what needs to be done that day. They would share information in real time and when problems arose, they would consult one another and think about what to do next. Second, the doctors and nurses in the NICU worked with an agreed upon set of practices. Each doctor or nurse who came to my child's bedside didn't get to choose which practice or which approach they would use that day. Similarly, we know a lot in education about what works. We know a lot, for example, about how to teach young children to read. So the question is not how do we do it, the question is, the question is, will we organize ourselves to ensure that every adult, every teacher uses those best practices and that every child has access to them? Third, the team of doctors and nurses in the NICU had specialized roles. Being able to take blood is different than diagnosing meningitis, which is different than putting a little baby's breathing tube back in. Similarly, a team of teachers might not all be experts in teaching fractions. The key is, when a group of students are struggling with fractions, there is someone on that team who's great at, te at teaching fractions, and we're able to put the children who need that learning with that teacher. And lastly, the team of doctors and nurses in the NICU had as part of the team novice doctors, people who are learning how to do the work. Our team of teachers, too, should have novice teachers, people who are apprenticing to a newly organized profession, but who are also contributing to the education of children at an early stage in their career. <clears throat> Making these kinds of changes in education will be a significant investment. It'll take time and focus and resources. It'll probably take a couple generations, and we'll have to stick to it. But if we don't make this investment, we run a great risk. In the short run, we risk continuing to tear down the teaching profession and teachers themselves, people who have committed to some of our hardest and most important work. In the long run, we risk finding out if our democracy and, to be frank, our economy can survive and even thrive with millions of children who don't gain the skills they need. This may not apply to your kids, this definitely applies to our kids. One of the great promises of our country and of our democracy 
is that we care for the collective. This is a question about shared responsibility. The love that a parent feels for their children is both indescribable and universal. I love my son and my daughter. <laughs> I would do anything for them. I want the best for them, just like every other parent. As I watch Isaiah now, he's nine years old, I watch him run around the soccer field, and I think back to the team of doctors and nurses and how they were organized to ensure that he and every child in that NICU had the best possible chance at a happy and healthy life. And I wish the same thing for every child. 